All right, we are just about to uh, resume. So uh, given our lag, I'll just wait five more seconds before everybody gets uh, set up on the live stream. Um, welcome, Tyler. Welcome, Vitalik. Um, to all of our audiences, thank you so much for being with us for the full day here. This is our last talk, and this is a talk I'm super excited about on my end. And uh, we are super thrilled to be joined tonight by uh, Tyler and Vitalik. Uh, Tyler is a professor of economics at George Mason University and uh, the author of a popular blog called Marginal Revolution. And he's also the post, uh, host of the podcast, uh, Conversations with Tyler. Um, he has described his personal moonshot as uh, using the internet to uh, ferment broad enlightenment. And uh, we hope that tonight's talk will aid in, in that goal in uh, a small manner. Uh, and Vitalik, um, who uh, should not need a big introduction to our community, uh, he is the inventor of Bitcoin Magazine, and now he spends his time as a chief scientist of the Ethereum Foundation. So in 2018, uh, Vitalik joined Tyler for an episode uh, of his podcast, Conversations with Tyler. And uh, we want to think of this conversation as a spiritual successor to that episode, uh, but with a slight difference where the tables will be turned around a little bit, and this time it'll be Vitalik doing the interviewing. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Tyler and Vitalik on stage and I'll let them take off with their conversation. Welcome. Thank, thank you very much. Um, it's uh, good to be here. Um, so you know, 2020 has been, I guess, uh, such a fascinating year. And I think it's uh, also been fascinating in part just as a culmination of uh, a lot of trends that have been happening for the last 15, 15 years, 20 years, um, you know, we've been seeing with uh, Trump and other political things happening the last four years, um, just comparing it to the financial crisis that we had 12 years ago, uh, some of the uh, of techno politics uh, that um, um, that we've had looking at, you know, Snowden back in 2013, the uh, of copyright wars that were uh, all of the rage in the zero zeros. Um, so I want to wanted to start by you know, taking a look back at uh, of what I call kind of techno idealism more broadly, right? Like, I think many people view um, what the crypto space is doing as a uh, kind of continuation of this project of uh, techno idealism. And there's you know, there's different kinds of techno idealism, right? There's a techno libertarianism with uh, John Perry, Perry Barlow's uh, declaration in 1996 and uh, trying to establish the internet as a separate space away from government intervention. And there's a uh, techno egalitarianism and nobody knows that you're a, uh, if you're a dog um, techno world peace uh, can we just uh, make everybody more connected uh, techno efficient markets uh, with uh, your and Alex's post uh, from a 2015 on uh, the end of asymmetric yet um, information and you know there's been all of the ways in which sort of the, the world has responded to these ideas and people trying to implement these ideas so taking a look back um, uh, roughly the uh, 25 years uh, since the uh, declaration of uh, cyberspace independence and ask the question, where do you see techno idealism in general? Uh, and I guess focused on uh, kind of infotech particularly as having succeeded and uh, where do you see it as having failed? Well, if we look at the last eight or nine months, I think we've seen a validation of what you might call well-capitalized big tech in the United States, most prominently Amazon. People now trust those companies They've way outperformed their competitors. It's good for tech. It may or may not be good for crypto, right? Mm. I think we have also seen a validation of using electronic media, including Twitter, but much more broadly, having scientists communicate with each other. Well, that's a very old story. You hear that at the beginning of the techno revolution, that this is going to happen. This is the year where it really mattered. So we've seen a great deal of progress in understanding COVID-19. And that has been because of tech, would not have happened in any other era. So in the last nine months, those are the techno-utopian trends that look much better. If you're asking me about the last 25 years, I think what has been underpredicted is just the resulting increase in disorientation and how poorly we as human beings deal with the world where so many things are transparent, everything is said about everyone, every rumor is out there. And uh, we just don't sort it very well. And in the meantime, we blame it on companies. That maybe is the biggest trend over the longer time period. Mm -hmm. um, so 
Peter, here, here's a question. Uh, Peter Thiel said um, a couple of years ago that uh, AI is communist and uh, crypto is libertarian. What do you think of that statement? I don't think we know yet. So we don't know what role crypto will play in the world's future. Crypto looks libertarian now. I, I'm happy about that. Uh, but the story is far from over. Hmm. Uh, AI is in some ways totalitarian, so surveillance seems to be here to stay. Very few citizenries are opposing surveillance. But oddly enough, having more surveillance while I oppose it, it may in some ways give governments room to open up other liberties for people. In part, China feels as free as it does because there's surveillance. There's not a policeman on every street corner. It's not gonna be the case as in the old days of behind the Iron Curtain. You had to worry about someone coming up to you and grabbing you by the collar and hauling you away. So surveillance has some aspects uh, that make autocratic societies freer. Mm, and the end of uh, imperfect information in another way, I guess. Hmm. Um, so one of the um, interesting things um, that's uh, been happening, I think, both in the crypto space and in the world at large, uh, is there is a yeah, conversation about governance. Uh, so within the crypto space, uh, and for, ex uh, for example, you know, we've been seeing um, things um, like uh, some of these uh, discussions kind of in Zcash, for example, where they as a community are trying or have uh, decided to extend to the 20% portion of their block reward that goes to fund protocol development. Bitcoin Cash has been trying to create a uh, developer fund, but it's much ended up being a much more acrimonious and uh, unsuccessful process with a lot of opposition. And in the Ethereum community, we've been having these uh, Gitcoin grants experiments with quadratic funding. Um, sometimes the governance has even blown up. Uh, so there was this uh, fun um, incident uh, a few months ago where Justin Sun uh, tried to pull off a kind of hostile takeover of the Steam network and its uh, governance mechanism. And the community reacted to this by making a fork of Steam called Hive, where they actually deleted the money of uh, Justin Sun and everyone else who participated in the attack. Right. So these things are all happening in crypto. And meanwhile, in the real world, and especially over the last month or so, we've been seeing a lot of drama around Twitter, uh, a lot of drama around social media platforms, how those platforms should moderate the challenges that uh, those platforms have in be, uh, basically trying to be what I call credibly neutral and uh, not just being fair, but actually succeeding in uh, kind of convin uh, convincing the large uh, mass of people that uh, um, that they're fair. Um, so I guess the first question would be is uh, just directly Twitter focused, which is like, if you were Jack or in the case of Facebook, if you were Mark, um, you know, what would you do? Um, you know, what kinds of, uh, how would you kind of govern moderation, I guess? And the broader question is kind of, might there be potentially kind of common trends between the things that crypto, the, the crypto space is figuring out and the things that the, the larger space is figuring out and you know, might they end up interacting with each other? Many different questions are in there. Let me take hmm. it in a slightly different order. Sure. If I think of crypto governance right now, I think there's a great virtue and a great problem and they stem from the same factor. There's a massive subsidization of resources moving into crypto because these successful assets have portfolio values that were not foreseen initially. So just an incredible flow of wealth into the crypto space that attracts smart people and a lot of experimentations because of those portfolio values, which doesn't at this point require that much creativity from crypto. You can just hold some Bitcoin. If a bunch of companies put 1% of their portfolio in Bitcoin, you know, my goodness, the value uh, can go up a lot more, same with Ether. That subsidization also means you don't have the discipline on your governance experiments. So people can mm -hmm. try all sorts of things. It's hard to tell what really works because there's mm -hmm. just this flood or wave of wealth coming your way. So uh, it might in a sense be better for crypto in some ways not to have that wave of wealth washing over mm -hmm. it. So I don't think we'll know for a long time which of the mechanisms do well. There's not like a competitive market discipline. It would be like if companies did venture capital and it just so happened 
that every year, you know, billions of dollars of manna rained on them from heaven. Uh, they would get very sloppy. They would take some more chances. Some of those would work. Now, you asked about Facebook and Twitter, and I think always of Balaji when these topics come up. My historical perspective is that media have always been unfair in every society. For the most part, they've gotten away with it. I don't foresee a near-term future where, say, there's a truly decentralized crypto-run version of Twitter. I think hardly anyone cares other than people like us. I do myself care. I think Twitter will continue more or less as is, and it will make whatever political finesses are needed. And if Joseph Biden is elected, I think the Democrats will set up a new regulatory agency to cover Facebook and Twitter. It will somewhat cartelize the sector or cement them in as incumbents, lift higher transactions costs, they'll be more labor intensive, less innovative, but we'll ultimately get a version of them a bit like what we have now, except they'll be more risk averse. And it, it will be bad, but I think it's more or less a stable outcome just ordinary, say, American users, I don't see them leaping to an alternative because there's some complex argument about how it's more balanced or freedom of speech or no one can take this away from you. Um, hmm. There's nothing in the previous history of media that leads me to think an outcome like that or even the current status quo is unstable. I think some version of it will continue. Of course, it will change and evolve. But I don't see crypto per se having a major role in the evolution there, not soon. Hmm. I think just sorting out internally which governance experiments are working will be mm -hmm. the main task of crypto. And right. Like answering, is it just a portfolio instrument? Which is fine. I'm all for that. Or is there something you can do with it transactionally that will truly be transformative? And the two possibilities, they're somewhat at war with each other. Transactionally, mm -hmm. you want it to have at least a predictable value, but probably also a stable value. For your portfolio, you want it to behave in ways not so well correlated with other assets. And that mm. means a certain kind of instability or unpredictability. Like here's the weird asset whose beta you don't really understand and that's why it's a great edge. So there are these two forces tugging on crypto. And I don't know which will win. I'm convinced the portfolio demand is real and enduring, uh, but I'm not at all sure which of the governance and transactional experiments are gonna work out. Mm -hmm. I think no, I guess, no, you know, this this just makes me wonder, like if uh, if it is the case that um, you know in the real world there's just not that many people, except for a few idealists that care about uh, basically the big platforms being new, being neutral in any sense. Then, the, like, does that create some kind of pressure for even like, base crypto projects as um, as well to also end up abandoning those values in the long run? Like, if there is an opportunity to abandon them for competitive advantage? Again, that's a tough question. So I'm not convinced the long-run future of crypto is libertarian. There's always a way to co-opt crypto. And the key question will be when crypto truly tries to interact with the banking system, not just at arm's length, how will regulators respond? Will they let banking and commerce in some way merge? A long-standing dispute in the United States or will crypto be forced to play by the regulatory rules of the game, which I suppose I think is somewhat more likely. And then crypto will solve a bunch of internal problems. Maybe you use it to send remittances to Mexico. It will become tamed and a kind of conservative thing. Just on the Twitter question, like you and I right now, we could go to Mastodon mm -hmm. and say what we want to each other. We don't do that, right? We read each other on mm -hmm. Twitter and we're worried about this problem. So I think the rest of the world is somehow going to react and make a change. That's fair. Um, I mean, one counterpoint is that there has been this move from Twitter to Substack that's really accelerated this past half year. And so it does seem possible for, mm, I guess, new things to start or like, what's your take on why Substack has been getting popular? I think it's people trust the media less, typically for good reason. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a sense of censorship, but I don't think most of it is from Twitter. I think right, most of it is from mainstream media and just people learning as they have with crypto assets. Like, hey, I can make a lot of money this way, which was not focal to them before. So I think there'll be a lot of proliferation and Twitter will be less central than it is right now. There'll be a mm -hmm. lot more alternatives. 
simple things mm -hmm. like WhatsApp, but improved version of WhatsApp, right. uh, will displace a lot of Twitter attention. Clubhouse will displace a bit of Twitter attention. So I'm an optimist about more diversity, more choice. It yeah. will limit the ability of Twitter to censor, and that will in turn keep Twitter as more or less a going viable concern rather than some stranger centralized version of it where it's not really run by anyone. I mean, even in the space you work in, it seems to me there's somewhat more governance than there was two years ago. And I asked you this two years ago. I said, as Ethereum services become more popular, you know, will there be more or less governance? Mm. And I think my sense from a distance is things like upgradability matter more and there's more direct involvement and discussion the kind of dogmatic it's just what the algorithm spits out uh that yeah. seems weaker than it did a few years ago when you have you know the bitcoin the bitcoin purists and it has to be bitcoin cash and so on i think hmm. governance and institutions are winning in what is a necessary and probably healthy way and you're a part of that mm -hmm. nope, that's, congratulations uh, <laughs> but i think it's a little different than your original vision no th this is true i mean what like I think a few years ago, well, there was a uh, back when uh, I like I was first starting on my uh, kind of journey of uh, researching crypto economics, and uh, back when I guess I knew less and we knew less, uh, I definitely had more hope that uh, to the extent that governance is necessary, there is like some closed uh, formula that could just deliver a uh, something close to a good result in a very robust way. Uh, the, the same way that say we seem to have for you know decentralized consensus with uh, you know proof of work and um, and proof of stake and all these academic algorithms that are provably robust up to one third fault or whatever that we've had for 25 years. Um, but as I've just studied the issue and studied the um, economics of the issue over time, it definitely has become clear that there's this uh, kind of fundamental instability in the governance um, that especially happens once your models start admitting the possibility that the different actors in the game are colluding with each other. Um, and so you know, basically something robust that you almost can't even be passive. It has to be active to some extent, like uh, with the example I gave where the uh, um, attack on Steve by Justin uh, Sangat got, got responded to with the community um, rising up and forking. In Ethereum 2.0, it's fundamentally an act of governance and institutional creation. In some ways, it's like the American Constitutional Convention mm -hmm. uh, and not very algorithmic. Mm. So I think maybe the future for crypto is you have a, a bunch of very good institutions evolve, often focused around individuals, just like Jimmy Wales is still important for Wikipedia, no matter how much he does or does not do on a given day. He's like a certifier of trust. And then in the nooks and crannies of the systems, you will have micro parts that do say all internet transactions with no Oracle problem, simply on the strict terms of the original vision. But whenever you have to interact more with the so-called real world, it'll get back more to governance and trust. Mm -hmm. People will okay. trust say you and the foundation and ether more than they'll trust a lot of other institutions. Again, not everyone. A lot of people just will never understand what you're doing. But I think right. we're in that world already and we're just gonna see this ongoing proliferation of trusted kind of micro institutions, but they have a very long reach in terms of what they enable people to do. Mm -hmm. No, this is uh, de um, definitely a uh, kind of future that I, um, that I see as being quite possible. Um, a present, you could argue, right? I know yep, Ethereum 2.0 is not here in the literal sense, but it's on the drawing board, pieces are in place, well, right? It's literally on a test net, so. Yeah. yeah, when I read your FAQs, like on sharding and on uh, <clears throat> everything you're doing to make it work better, proof of stake, it just feels to me like this is an institution and how it works is not being reduced to a small number of dimensions. That to me is what is striking. Yes. So one um, other thing that's uh, just interesting about both crypto and uh, of centralized tech is the somewhat differing relationship between, I guess, 
non-governmental projects and government uh, or including corporations and including non-corporate things and governments um, that we've uh, um, that we've seen. And I mean, of course, um, you know, it's like government governments being the kind of sole and primary top dog is definitely not the a uh, 10,000 year historical norm. And historically we've seen lots of things have uh, kind of intersecting authority, including uh, various kinds of religions and uh, plenty of other, of other things as well. Um, but one thing that st strikes me as interesting is that like, if you look at the discourse, even just going back to Twitter for a bit briefly, right? Like there is still a mentality that kind of public and governmental are the same thing. Um, and because Twitter is a kind of quote public concern and Twitter affects lots of people, um, there, therefore it should be you know, the government, meaning the US government as an expression of uh, the will of the people, actually meaning the US people that should have kind of somehow have, um, have a say on the whole thing. And I'm of course not from the US and I'm, well, I haven't spent more than half a year in any single country since the 2013 and even the crypto community is just very naturally global like in any non-pandemic year you have people seeing each other in random countries uh, every two months and i've referred to twitter before as uh, kind of the world water cooler right so you know you have uh, people from all sorts of places just kind of seem like they they're standing to all two meters away from each other just you know, talking to each other, each other in this big uh, cacophony. And you have, uh, you know, people from the US, so you got, you know, the wonderful uh, diplomats from China, and you have all sorts of people from India. Um, there was that beautiful moment uh, a couple of years ago where the government of Iran um, tweeted out um, this uh, trenchant message uh, saying, Israel is a malignant cancerous tumor in the West Asian region that has to be removed and eradicated. And an Israeli embassy replied back with a meme from Mean Girls asking, why are you so obsessed with me? <laughs> no, that, that, that moment was just uh, kind of great. But you know, just thinking about like who uses Twitter, like it seems clearly that just from a kind of institution design perspective, it's like the U.S. as a country is the wrong actor to be uh, kind of having ultimate control of the thing. And I guess like this is why for me, you know, given the kind of imperfect world we live in, like I'm, I actually think kind of Jack calling the shots in the uh, is just is less bad than a lot of other people think. Um, but the kind of the broader thing, right, is that you do have these centralized platforms that are serving a global audience, um, but at the same time, they are based in a particular country. On the other hand, you know, you have crypto projects that are serving a global audience. And in a lot of cases, they actually are global. And in a lot of cases, you can argue like, you know, in the case of Bitcoin, like 60% of the miners are in China, but then most of the developers are in the US um, and, and some in Europe. Uh, so, yeah, how, how do you see this tension uh, proceeding in the future? I think the two big winners from the internet are the United States and China. The internet means a significant increase in one kind of America's soft power. So some of our leaders have destroyed some versions of our soft power. But just globally, people debate, debate American ideas. So a big movement in Iran now, I read, is Me Too. Where did that come from, right? Uh, throughout Africa, how people react to Black Lives Matter with a lot of diversity, but that's a major issue. So I think once the immediate moment passes, the United States will see Twitter and the internet for a major source of soft power. They cement in English. People who are active in the United States intellectual community have far greater global reach than, say, hmm. Germans do. And that's been a relative shift compared to 15 or 20 years ago. The US will accept that. I think other nations already have accepted it. We won't admit it. It seems to me we're already there. We just need to let our mental models catch up to a world we're already living in. And who so exactly is going to defect? So if you're a German public intellectual, your relative status is much lower, actually. You probably won't admit it. You don't have the power to do a significant defect from the broader system. In fact, you'll probably be more likely to play by its rules of the game. And to you, Matt Iglesias will be a big deal, even though in 1968, he never would have been. Mm -hmm. He would have only been a big deal to other Americans or maybe Canadians. Yeah. No, so Balaji has uh, talked about the, you know, the difference between physical America and uh, digital America. 
And so like, for example, I personally, right, I've spent, you know, once again, in normal years, less than one sixth of my time in physical America. But you know, like, would you consider me part of digital America? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. You can no, talk about any American issue with great facility. And obviously you have totally perfect fluent English. That's all you need. Hmm. So um, I guess this is interesting, right? Because this gets to this uh, kind of philosophical discussion about you know, what uh, kind of quote America even, uh, like, even is. Like if it's, uh, if it's not just the company and the jurisdiction um, and it's not just the, uh, and it includes these uh, kind of tech, uh, tech platforms and it includes people who just uh, kind of understands this particular bundle of cultural issues that are, um, that, that are affecting this particular kind of bundle of people, like, you know, you know, I mean, what is America and what is any country? I and mean, is, the, is the answer different for different countries? I think it's different for every country. Keep in mind, America is going to get a big boost once COVID is over, because work from a distance is now much more feasible, even if it's not all the time or every day. So real rents for a large number of people are going to plummet, whether you stay behind Rents in San Francisco are down 31%, or whether you move to Austin, Miami, Nashville, wherever. So that's this big boost to standard of living. It'll make people happier. Uh, it'll be a big shot in the arm to the country. And then American soft power is stronger. And at the same time, we'll be more of a mess. But I don't see what there is about globalization that overturns that. And then if you think that US and China will continue to evolve separate internets, China remains a bit removed from that equation. And that actually cements the relative status of the US in some ways. And China will take Cambodia, Laos, and some other nations with it. But if you're, say, Singapore, New Zealand, uh, you're going to play in that big network and basically accept its rules. Mm -hmm. yep, this is uh, true. I, mean, I guess um, like if I'm a uh, Sing Singaporean or you know, New Zealand or whatever, intellectual and I interact with this cloud as part of these uh, internet platforms, then I mean, I guess, you know, you could say that I'm part of the, uh, I'm part of digital America, but I guess the, the question would then be that, you know, to what extent does, uh, like to what extent, I guess, to what extent is it legitimate to call it, I mean, you know, digital America as opposed to saying, you know, the digital Anglosphere um, even, like to what extent does, um, I, I, physical America or any kind of core end up get uh, end up actually becoming a kind of dis, um, disproportionately the center of the network. I think it's fine to call it Anglosphere, but still mm -hmm. so much of it will be American. The emphasis on entertainment mm -hmm. is more American than British. If you look at important internet writers, say from Britain, Andrew Sullivan, moved to America a long time ago. Mm -hmm. The kind of independent number of truly British, Kiwi, Australian voices. I mean, in absolute terms, it's a lot of people. In terms of the gravity of influence as you would measure in a network model, it's striking to me how American it stayed and what mm -hmm. the incentives are to move to either American centers or London or possibly Singapore. Uh, there'll still be strong incentives for intellectuals to cluster. And there aren't mm -hmm. that many places they can do it. I think London also is a big winner from this. This is true. Um, in the, um, no, the, the, the London uh, be, uh, becoming a, a kind of cultural outpost of uh, something that you know, of digital America is definitely a fun historical irony to some extent. Um, and you, you see London picking up on American wokeism and political correctness to a considerable mm -hmm. degree, and you don't see that on very much of the European continent. And that division, mm -hmm. as outlined by Bruno Machais on Twitter, I might add, a Portuguese fellow who writes in English <laughs> yes. on Twitter. Uh, I think that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. Brexit was a more significant event than we realized. In addition mm -hmm. to the obvious changes, it's the UK, or at least England, deciding it will be part of the Anglosphere and continental mm -hmm. Europe deciding it won't. And on all sorts of other issues like attitudes towards Islam, there's going to be mm -hmm. this split, which I think is here already. 
Yeah, no, this is an, on. A, I made a yeah, comment on Twitter at, at least once, maybe multiple times, where I said that I think in the 21st century people will be divided um, not less by geography and more by language. Um, so and gender think, also, it's a separate point, but I think those are the divisions that will matter. Hmm. Okay. Um, so I guess uh, back to uh, kind of crypto discussions um, a little bit. Uh, so I think a lot of people, especially those who are somewhat far away from the uh, crypto space, uh, see it as being primarily a, a financial thing. Um, you know, you have Bitcoin as an asset, um, you have Ether as an asset, you have both of those uh, systems as a system that you can use to pay people, uh, you have stable coins. There's also a potential for um, kind of blockchains uh, and other uh, kind of what we call crypto technologies, you know, zero knowledge proofs being a really big one as being a base for other like non-financial applications, for example. Um, do you see any potential for non-financial app uh, applications that use blockchains to uh, get anywhere? Um, and if so, are there any particular categories that you see as being uh, more promising? Well, keep in mind as an economist, to me, financial things are real things automatically anyway. But I think just enabling new classes of transactions. So if you're going to run micro prediction markets, and I'm not convinced they will take off, but they might, plausibly you would want to do that on a global basis, and you would do that using crypto. And crypto will be well geared to support that kind of market. That I could well imagine happening, not this year, but reasonably soon. As virtual mm -hmm. reality develops, and there mm -hmm. are semi-autonomous worlds within virtual reality. If that happens, I, I'm not an expert on that topic, but again, imagine it happens. You could very readily imagine crypto being very well suited in its current evolution to enable this very new class of transactions. So those to me could be big deals and they're not mm -hmm. quite next month things, but you mm -hmm. know, we will live to see that happen. So I think no. there's a lot of promise. But again, we're in this weird governance mix I don't think anyone has a very clear sense of which of those will work. And even simple questions like putting aside crypto, why don't we have more prediction markets? You can argue that till you're blue in the face. I don't think there are good answers. I've never met a person who really understands that question. Right. No, it definitely is a puzzle. And especially given how like the amount of trading that happens on a regular financial markets, as I understand, is like much higher than all of the no trade theorems would end up predicting. Then you have all these other markets. You would think it's obvious they would exist. Oh, a futures market in GDP, in unemployment. And mm. poof, they're not there. In the 1980s, they tried a futures market in the CPI. Everyone was mm. convinced that would be a big hit. Went poof. Mm. Now, these days we have lower inflation, you know, we, we don't right. need it. I mean, still, we the do whole question to... of missing markets, one of the mm. central questions of economics, we don't understand it well as economists at all. Mm -hmm. So a lot right. of the future of crypto, I think, is tied up with what are your micro foundations for why these markets are missing? It could be it's something so fundamental, crypto won't overcome it. That's mm -hmm. a more bearish scenario for crypto. It could just be they need the right nudge. They need some you know, oil and grease in the wheels, uh, ways of avoiding certain regulations, ways of globalizing more easily. And then crypto will give us this huge takeoff. Mm -hmm. no, that's uh, definitely true. And uh, we've been seeing this uh, kind of small but growing explosion in uh, prediction markets um, on Ethereum in the last uh, couple of months. And I made a... Uh, I made a bet on the uh, on the Trump market. I won't say which side, but I'm you know I'm contrarian, but not super contrarian. So you can probably guess which side that is. Um, the um, you bet on Hillary Clinton to be next president. <laughs> she is in those markets still. <laughs> this is no, no. no I, told, I I bet Zuckerberg. Come on. <laughs> um, the it, it's. Uh, like they're definitely getting easy. Ease of use has, I think, been one of the kind of drawbacks for crypt, uh, 
crypto historically, right? And, you know, you have to interact with this blockchain. You have to send one transaction and then you wait 14 seconds for it to get included. And sometimes it's four minutes and then uh, you send another transaction. Um, ironically enough, at uh, the time I made a, a trade on the prediction market, uh, it was a time of like very high congestion on the Ethereum network. And I, I paid a, a transaction fee of uh, $17.76. Um, which is uh, fun, um, but you know, at the same time, we're working on uh, sc um, working on scalability. We are working on uh, a lot of uh, kind of efficiency things. Which you know, there's sharding, rollups, um, you know, zk rollups, optimistic, all of these buzzwords. And if they succeed, they should like the math says that they'll decrease all of those costs by a factor of somewhere between one hundred to ten thousand. So I guess. That might uh, that might be when the experiments will be, and uh, you know if it fails, then then we can really say that it failed because there's no micro foundations, and uh, if it succeeds, then uh, you know user experience really was the the, uh, the barrier. Um, it'll be I'm interesting. very bullish on all the tech stuff you're doing, but let me tell you my worry. Mm -hmm. If you go back and you look at hyperinflations in history, like look at Israel in the 1970s, there were no practical barriers to denominating your contract in terms of US dollars. Mm -hmm. People wouldn't do so until the rate of price inflation hit about 40%. Now 40 is pretty high. You might think at eight or 9%, they would start thinking about redoing the contract, but they waited until 40. It seemed there were these mental transactions costs that were very mm -hmm. high. It's what we see in nominal wage stickiness, which is mm -hmm. in virtually all societies. If those are very fundamental and can't be overcome by crypto, overcome by sharding, overcome by greater speed, mm -hmm. you're in the more bearish scenario for crypto more generally, and it stays a portfolio hedge asset, but doesn't open up this broad class of new transactions. That to me is possible too. Hmm. Um, does, uh, does crypto need to become a unit of accounts to open up a broad class of new transactions? I don't think it needs to become a widely used unit of account, but simply to think things through in terms of this other system, this other medium, you might need for dollars and other currencies to be much worse than they are. And maybe that day will come, right? That's possible too. But it doesn't seem to be now. And just how, how sharp that substitutability is, that's always the variable I'm mentally trying to estimate in forming my own forecasts for crypto. Mm -hmm. I'm no, quite sure I don't know. No, no, this is a, also an interesting question, right? Because, uh, I mean, so crypto, you know, there there is such a thing as crypto dollars, right? There's stable coins, you know, there's uh, the uh, algorithmic stable coins like DAI, there is um, the kind of asset backed ones like USDC and USDT and so forth. And like, if you look, you know, a lot of them have like very terrible trust properties, right? I mean, like DAI is fairly reasonable, uh, but uh, historically, but I mean, USDT is, um, held in some bank in the Bahamas. And I think like the terms of service say that the, that the entire $15 billion belongs to them. I mean, something like this, I don't remember the details, um, but people are still willing to use it and hold it and just use it as the base medium for a, uh, for a lot of crypto trading. Uh, so it almost seems like in the short term, the, uh, I guess the dollar is winning as a, a unit of, uh, a base unit of accounts inside crypto, um, which is interesting. I and mean, well, I guess in the long run, will it flip over to you know, like BTC or ETH or both or, or, or something else? I don't know. Uh, but you know, there has been this interesting trend right now. Rise of these stable coins rather, makes me more bearish on crypto for the mm -hmm. reasons implicit in what you're saying. Keep in mind also in world history, exchange rate pegs, fixes, they have never, ever, ever held. Not in mm -hmm. millennia. Bretton Woods lasted, I mean, it's debated how long it lasted, maybe 11 years. And that was a system backed by all the world's major free countries and a lot of nuclear weapons. And that lasts mm -hmm. 11 years. And how long am I supposed to think the stable coins will last? Uh, I, I'm all for those as experiments. I just think they'll become more floating exchange rates, which, I, which I'm fine with. I wrote a yep. whole book defending that idea when I was starting my career. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't think stable coins are stable ever. Mm -hmm. That's fair. Uh, yes, uh, yeah, something, something, something. Fat, um, fat tail risks very possible. Um, so, going into kind of the macro foundation, uh, kind of the 
cultural macro foundations for crypto. One of the big ones that a lot of people talk about, right, is distrust in governments that, you know, Bitcoin, like for example, people, for example, talk about um, Bitcoin being this um, trust, um, this uh, thing that people will gravitate to because they just see how, you know, the US dollar is going, like, as the meme says, you know, money printer go burr. Um, and uh, they see Bitcoin as having this kind of sounder foundation. And even like uh, Bruno made this a tweet a couple of years back, um, using the uh, kind of crypto drama as a, as an example for why people would see the value in the more decentralized solutions. And, and in general, it has this uh, idea that decentralized technology could thrive because governments, as this uh, and huge historically dominant root of trust are losing are, are losing the trust has been fairly large right and you know, so 2020 has been an interesting year for people's trust in uh, governments I and mean, in a lot of in a lot of places it's decreasing uh, I mean, in East Asia, people's trust in their own government governments is at a high point, but people's trust in uh, each other's governments is uh, definitely um, is definitely decreasing as well. Um, so, I guess, do we? Um, how do you see the future of uh, just trust in gov uh, in governments general in, in general as being like? Is this something that even can be a kind of broken down? Like, is uh, financial trust and geopolitical trust different? Are they ultimately the same? Um, to what extent is this so, uh, a, a, a driver for crypto? Um, and you know, I guess, where will this go? Well, for, for thinking about crypto, I would distinguish between trust in government and trust in the Fed. Mm -hmm. People trust Congress less or Trump less or the other party less. That's very obvious and it's a big deal socially. But in terms of institutions, Fed has had a 12 year run of a totally amazing positive performance, in my opinion and people trust it a lot more. It's the first place Congress goes, Treasury goes there. You need a problem solved, you have the Fed do it. They did okay enough in 2008. Uh, this time around, they did phenomenally well. It's like Fed and the NBA are our two well-functioning fun institutions. So when the Fed does well, that holds back crypto because it papers over problems in American banks, banking system. And people as well, I'll use banks because the Fed stands behind those and the Fed's been doing well. Like the mm -hmm. NBA does fit tests well. Now there's two ways of looking at it. One is just that is really credible and that will keep crypto at bay for a long time. An alternative view is, well, the Fed has done a great job, but they only have so much credibility and they've spent it down maybe in an optimal way, but they can only pull so much water from the well and we're getting closer to the Fed not being able to paper over, paper over those problems in the banking system. And this is like medium term, very bullish for crypto. It's the idea of, eh, it takes three days to clear. You know, who gives a damn? I know the Fed stands behind this all. People maybe won't say that, you know, 17 years from now. And they'll be thinking about safer, more transparent alternatives. And that would be a big boon for crypto. And again, yeah. there's two very different paths. I'm quite sure, I don't know which is true, but I think a lot for crypto depends on which you find to be the plausible scenario. Yeah, okay. Um, moving on a bit to um, radical markets. Uh, so, a you know, we I think last time we talked, we talked a bit about quadratic funding um, and back then quadratic funding was mostly just an idea. I mean, it was this uh, in a paper from uh, myself and Glenn, uh, but you know, since then, and in the Ethereum ecosystem, I don't know how much you've been following, but we've done these experiments with it with a Gitcoin grant. So we have distributed yep. about $2 million with the quadratic funding uh, and, and people seem mostly happy with the results. Uh, there have been experiments with uh, you know, kind of downtown stimulus trying to use it in uh, Colorado to fund businesses. Um, so um, how, I guess, how have you, your views on uh, quadratic funding and quadratic other things changed? And like, where do you see the long-term future of those ideas being? I think it can work. It's been shown they can work. There'll be a greater diversity of many, many things, including those ideas. But when I think about collective choice in general, to me, the key input is the quality of voter preferences. And mm -hmm. if you're getting bad outcomes, it's not like, oh, we need a new electoral system. We need to you know, change how the Senate works or move to proportional representation. Those may or may not be good ideas. I don't think mm -hmm. they're fundamental. It's the quality of the inputs. What do people want? What does your culture tell people is or should be important? Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure any of those mechanisms 
will make a big difference for our largest problems. But I think especially with very well-educated communities, as are connected to, you know, Ethereum, uh, there's kind of a lot of things you can take care of more effectively because within the model, the efficiency properties of those methods are clear and you can use them, right? Yep, this is true. I can, in, I, you know, the you know, quality of inputs is definitely one of those things that you just uh, can't uh, get ar uh, get around uh, and just needing to have if he wants to have good outcomes. Um, so I guess um, before the uh, um, audience questions, I wanted to finish off with a um, overrated versus underrated section. Oh, of course. Uh, yes, uh, central bank issued digital currencies. I'm worried we will try them and they will suck the life out of our private banks. I think probably China can do this because it's private banks at state are so closely intertwined. It's in, in broad terms, one big system, but other countries doing it will either be a minor add on, which I'm fine with, but if it becomes really popular, you end up with your central banks as the intermediaries, your private banks as starved for deposits uh, being broadly libertarian. I see that as a bad thing. So I think they're overrated. But I'm not even sure they're rated that much at all, right? But I, I, I'm worried about the idea. Okay. Um, the idea that uh, remote work is uh, making it more viable to move between different countries. And so the market for which country people are, are, are residing in will become more competitive. I think remote work is making it much, much more viable to move around within a country. But the costs of moving to a different country, I don't think have fallen very much. A lot of those costs are your personal network. So you could move from Seattle to Vancouver. That still makes a big difference. I don't think the new viability of remote work changes that calculus very much. So moving across nations will change less than people are saying. But moving within nations is changing more than people are saying. Okay. Um, charter cities and uh, building new cities in general. People mean different things by the phrase charter city. If by mm. charter city you mean there'll be some big newspaper article that says this board of like eight people, six of whom are white guys, will like run a part of Africa, I don't think that will ever happen. Mm. But if by charter cities you mean governance becomes more complex and more diverse, and you have things arise, almost like shopping malls today, which clearly have their own governance. It's just embedded within a broader structure, but their actual problems they tend to solve on their own, including of course, security and often adjudication. That things like trade complexes, shopping malls, enterprise zones will become more significant and sovereign in an actual practical way. And they will be like the vision of charter cities. I think that's very definitely underrated. It's kind mm -hmm. of old fashioned, here's my charter city, let's all vote on you know, letting these people run Roatan, uh, I would predict that won't ever happen. Okay. Um, online to offline communities. So this idea that Balaji has been talking about of a kind of communities forming offline and then intentionally coming together in some place. Uh, what is it exactly you mean by that? Like we all move to Austin and eat barbecue together? Um, or poten potentially just people uh, agree to move to, uh, to move to a particular po uh, place for a longer period of time. I don't know. You know, overall, moving in the United States, you probably know, has gone down every decade since the early 1980s. People move less. Mm -hmm. They find one place they really like and they stay there. I think work from a distance will shift one place you find. But rather than Boston, maybe it's Chattanooga, cheaper, better weather. Over time, it will have food just as good as Boston. But I still think your tendency to move only once won't change so much. So we'll have different one-time moves to very different places, and that will matter a lot. But I don't think we'll see that much hopscotch, unless you mean you know the very wealthy who kind of fly around and in some ways don't quite live anywhere. OK, uh, virtual reality. It makes me dizzy, and I think I'm enough of a arbitrary subjectivist that I'm not convinced. Uh, so I'm not ready to press the button on predicting that one. I'll, I'll say overrated, but I could easily, easily be wrong. Because my main complaint 
so brutish and biological and simple and stupid. My argument is so unsophisticated. My argument is either totally correct or totally wrong. And it's probably mm -hmm. totally wrong, but I don't, I don't quite see the people want to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, small countries as a category. I think they will do fine, but they will attach themselves to larger units. They will have to make choices. Countries such as Singapore that play a complex game between China and the United States, they will be put in increasingly stressful and difficult positions. But at the end of the day, a lot of them are well run. They have to be well run to stay competitive. And I think we're going to do great. New Zealand now, uh, obviously, with COVID-19, Taiwan, you're seeing a lot of successes that will be replicated as future crises come along. And we had this long stretch of decades with few major crises. So the stupidities of large bungling countries, such as mine in Brazil, got away with it. And all of a sudden now, they're not getting away with it. And it is looking better. And it is, I mean, it's big physically, but it's like a small country in, in some ways, mm -hmm. especially um, non-Quebec Canada, and Quebec has done the worst. Yeah. Um, uh, the United Nations. Well, it's certainly vastly overrated by normal humans who went to public school and were told it was great. Mm -hmm. But when I look at actual econometric papers, like does the UN modestly reduce the scope of conflict in the world? In those papers, it seems it does. Does the UN on a regular, very totally regular basis put out messages that completely offend me? It does, so I don't like it. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's still a modest positive but declining all the time. And in many, many issues, it's just not a player. And again, the public school rhetoric is so over the top. I, I have to say overrated. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, that's... Uh... Definitely fair. I, you know, I, uh, I participated in a, a model he went in high school and it definitely uh, decreased my uh, perception of the real thing to some degree. Um, uh, Mars. I'm a skeptic about space travel. I'm not a skeptic about Mars per se, any more than any other location. It seems to me the journey is perilous. The experimentation for re-entry for normal humans in an age of litigation, complacency, and risk aversion is a lot to swallow. And I sometimes say, you know, when Nevada is full, I'll start to think about Mars. So I don't see what's there of value, unless you have a kind of utopian, libertarian, Heinlein-esque governance scenario that we're gonna go there and do things all over again. It just seems the costs and problems and radiation are so daunting and you end up dependent on the governments here anyway, for getting back and forth. But to me, it seems way overrated by those who are enthusiasts, but I'm not sure the normal American is wrong about it. Probably they expect nothing from Mars. And I think that's about right. Um, so what do you think um, is going to uh, take uh, the place uh, or, uh, of uh, people's need for some kind of frontier um, over the next century? Well, we may be frustrated and unhappy from not having a frontier, which arguably is the case now. But I see a lot of advance in biomedicine. It may not feel like a frontier to people, but it could make the world very strange and different. And people will talk about that much more than Mars. Mm -hmm. OK. Well, that's, and that ends the, uh, the list of things that I have. Uh, so I guess we can have some questions from the audience. Amazing. Well, Metallic Tyler, thank you so much for that conversation. Uh, what we're going to do is just going to, anybody listening, uh, feel free to start posting your questions. We've had a handful of them already come in. So as we kind of get them, we'll, we'll kind of ask them out. Uh, I kind of want to start off by uh, sort of more of an open-ended question for both of you. Uh, in this case, uh, Tyler, you kind of uh, talked about some of your opposing views on the use of blockchains and just in general, kind of uh, the need for uh, the, the feature it offers. Uh, I guess I'm curious on uh, hearing that from the Vitalik side, what are kind of some of the things that you would probably disagree on the most uh, from, from that argument and, and kind of, I feel like we only heard one side of their argument, but I'm curious to see no, if there's what, something what, you disagree. What's the um, argument that you want me to disagree with? Hmm. The, so, so Tyler kind of talked about that, uh, people largely may not care um, right. when we were kind of talking about Mastodon and just social media or just the benefits that you would get on censorship resistance or, or having mm -hmm. control over your information. 
Um, mm-hmm. What do I mean, you kind I of definitely, think There's definitely a, an effect that does happen a lot of the time where people don't care until uh, something personally affects them. Um, but I mean, the, eventually things is like, if it's a bad system, then eventually it will personally affect you, um, right? So, you know, historically, like, people start using VPNs when you know, like something that they personally want to access um, starts getting censored. Um, and I guess uh, people will use uh, crypto-based solutions when it, and it is the case that there is like some, spe- um, some specific issue that they, that they personally care about that the uh, existing platforms are not serving them well on. Um, so I guess it is possible um, that uh, just big centralized platforms are going to are, are going to miscalculate massively. Um, it is also possible that just um, in order, even just for lower grade uh, kind of public relations reasons, the uh, existing platforms are going to uh, kind of evolve some uh, evolve somewhat in a uh, kind of not fully cryptoy but uh, in a somewhat more decentralized direction. And so one of the reasons why I think this is. Uh, I wrote this uh, post uh, a year ago on uh, liability, uh, control as a liability. Um, this idea that you know, if you do put yourself into a position where you have control over a lot of things that can easily uh, co- come back to bite you. Um, and you know, if like, now of course reducing control doesn't, like, it could mean crypto, but it doesn't have to mean kind of going all out on the decentralization. It could even just mean something as simple as um, you know establishing some kind of independent uh, independent governing council as um, you know like mark has done uh, and just like let it, making that more transparent and letting it have a f- final say over um, over decisions in some way it could also mean that jack recently retweeted this uh, approach re- in favor of this approach where he says that people should be free to choose like uh, what moderation algorith- um, algorithms they want to uh, use uh, um, they use for their tweet which is also in- also interesting. So some degree of experimentation of that, of uh, those kinds of things I can see happening. Uh, I mean, fully decentralized things I, I, I expect will continue as a, in, as a niche uh, in the short term and uh, what they will be in the long term depends on like one is, you know, if they find a use case, two is if the, uh, the mainstream systems just completely break and three is if we can figure it out, figure it out technologically. Don't you find it striking how few Chinese use VPN or that TV network news in the US has always been terrible, even with cable and satellite? Mm. Those would be my comparator points. Right. I mean, th- this is true. Um, but I guess, well, I guess it depends on what your definition of like few versus many is. Like the number of VPN users is definitely in the tens of millions. Um, it's a... Uh, and it may even those tens of millions may even be the tens the the tens of millions that uh, kind of matter more uh, in terms of uh, just uh, their in, their long term impact on global culture. Um, the uh, it also I think is the case that um, even if these technologies do not get widely adopted, the credible threat of them getting widely adopted is enough to push uh, centralized actors to be uh, to be more reasonable. I guess the go-to example of this is uh, the argument that the possibility of people pirating everything um, in terms of just like movies and music um, really pushed the yeah, recording labels to become more reasonable and eventually and uh, start creating things like Spot, uh, Spotify and Netflix, um, which you know people use now. But um, arguably, if uh, the uh, ability to just illegally tour and things that did not exist as a backstop, the terms would be considerably less favor less favorable to consumers. I was going to see if Tyler was going to respond. Uh, no, uh, no, next question. Yeah. Great. Uh, um, a question for Tyler. Um, I, I, I think it's wrong <laughs> to think of Vitalik and I as disagreeing. I yeah. would say we have different stances. I'm a very detached, distant observer. He is mm-hmm. a doer. Let's say difference mm-hmm. in perspective is more important than our stances might differ. I would admit on all these issues, he knows more than I do, but would be inclined to bend toward him just epistemically on that basis. But still, his different role as doer and mine as distant observer will make us feel like we have somewhat different views when maybe we really don't. Hmm. Uh, 
Uh, no, absolutely. And it's also, uh, it's the time uh, interval that you're kind of debating this on also that matters and shifts that perspective. So I've mm -hmm. uh, kind of seen that happen and uh, and you've kind of brought up different timelines where this may be important or not important. Um, a question for Tyler is um, if you were trying to convince uh, some bright economic students um, that Ethereum was an interesting thing to study, um, how would you pitch it to them? I'm not sure the pitch matters. I think you need to see that a paper on Ethereum and related services can get in a top journal. There are some papers on crypto in top journals. There might be on Ethereum, Vitalik would know. I don't recall seeing one. And it's all proof by showing. They don't, they don't give a damn what you say. They want to see it. Mm -hmm. It's probably unfortunate. It shows too much conformism and status quo bias, but I think it's how it's working right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, there's definitely been uh, quite a bit of, ac of academic publishing on Ethereum within the cryptography space. I mean, within the economic space, well, there's uh, those uh, papers that uh, Eric Budish has uh, done, uh, and, and there's definitely uh, a few things here and there. Um, there's, uh, well, there's Tiff, Tim Roughgarden's um, of upcoming analysis on our uh, fee market reform uh, propo uh, proposal, the AP 1559, which, uh, I mean, it's not an academic paper in the standard sense, but it is something that uh, yes, could just uh, end up showing that, you know, this is an area that, ha um, that has interesting economic uh, pr problems that are worth looking at. Got it. Um, mm -hmm. Another question for Tyler, and uh, this is more around uh, the audience trying to understand if you have looked at or have followed uh, what's been happening recently in the world of decentralized finance or DeFi, um, and uh, if so, kind of what do you think about that as a uh, as sort of a new enablement uh, in kind of what's possible now, especially using uh, cryptocurrencies, and uh, kind of how do you think about that if if you have kind of paid attention to that sector? I read about it a fair amount, but I'm quite sure I don't understand it, and I'm not a participant. I suspect it's one of those areas to understand you need to actually try to do it. I would repeat my broader point. The flow of wealth into crypto has meant all these incredible experiments and the creation literally of new worlds, new vocabularies. To me, that's just phenomenal and exciting. At the same time, it has so weakened the market tests for these things. That the normal metrics I would use, look at say the market for thumbtacks, like which thumbtacks are gonna work? Well, I'm not a thumbtack profit, but I sort of know how to figure that out. Uh, I can't do that in these areas. So I read, I listen to podcasts, you know, like also on Bitcoin. Every, and at the end of it all, I'm basically confused. And I don't see that my mental models have let me narrow it down to questions reducible to a few dimensions. That's my impression. That's my answer. Totally acceptable answer. Um, a question for Vitalik is uh, uh, for a new developer um, in this ecosystem, what would you recommend um, that they start reading uh, to get involved in uh, developing the code base? And, and I think this is more uh, the way I understand it towards contributing to the development of Ethereum instead of building on top of it. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, happy to accept any answers and we'll clarify. Yeah, I mean, I think I just going through the process of developing a simple application on top of Ethereum, like even just a simple like wallet dApp or even just a, a dApp that uh, points to a smart contract and lets you click a button that sends a transaction and that adds uh, some uh, one to some number and just kind of walk through that entire process and see what all of the different steps are um, is a, a valuable exercise for a new developer to go through. Like my, uh, myself as a learner, I've uh, learned, felt like, and this just doing and uh, kind of getting into the nuts and bolts of things is uh, generally uh, a, a great uh, tech, uh, definitely a better technique than reading um, for just gi giving yourself a better understanding of like what the heck is going on in uh, d different parts. Um, then branching out from there, I think it really depends on uh, like, you know, what it is that you want to focus on. Like if you want to focus on you know, building and developing applications, then you, you might want to uh, look at existing ones. Um, if you're looking at the protocol, then you know, are you talking about ETH1, are we talking about ETH2, or are we talking about layer two protocols? Like, it, it's definitely uh, just important to kind of get a lay of the land in terms of what the space is and what all of these uh, different components are. As uh, 
you know, Ethereum is this sort of big ecosystem and there's a, a growing number of these just kind of baseline things that you do need to learn about and uh, keep track of. Um, and then from there, it depends on a specific thing. Um, and once again, you know, like if you want to uh, become an uh, ETH2 developer, just um, like poking around the spec, um, trying to uh, um, even like build a chain or uh, doing the same with ETH1. Like it's a, it's a challenge, but if you want to be a core dev, it's the sort of thing that you do have to just be able to do in principle. Um, and then just uh, go from there. Awesome. Um, next up, we have actually a clarification and, and more of a, an insight that we would love from Tyler. Uh, you kind of talked about when you were commenting on the, the US dominance uh, through uh, the media uh, power it has. Uh, and the question is, what about the rise of uh, non-American anglo soft power um, in kind of specifically the world of entertainment? So as kind of uh, the Indian, Nigerian, and, and a handful of other film industries sort of begin to really scale and take off um, to a lot bigger audiences, um, do you think that uh, the US will still retain that soft power uh, of having control over media content? Or did you mean something else from that uh, point? Or just kind of what's your reaction to that statement? Well, I think US soft power in movies has always been weaker than people have charged. That was formerly a major trade dispute. But soft power <clears throat> was super strong in Canada and a few other places. Uh, but of course, as you mentioned, never in India, uh, the Middle East, or, or many other parts of the world. Future US soft power is through the internet and social media. And that I think is still accelerating the extent to which, say the two of us, by having this conversation in what is North American English or reaching the whole world, uh, people haven't, haven't grasped the import of that yet. And it's not Hollywood, Hollywood is decaying, uh, not gonna have that soft power or carry it. Being much worse, of course, with COVID, but that was already the trend. So I think it's all about social media. Korean movies yeah. are better than Hollywood movies. It's not close. And, and sorry, is that a comment on the quality or the, the reach or the propagation of how many people end up viewing them? Or mm -hmm. sort of, is there a specific metric where you measure this against? I think there's been an act of self-destruction that goes on in Hollywood, precisely by trying to reach a more global market. It comes down the product, dialogue is less clever, more things blow up. And uh, say Korean cinema, a more extreme example, Iranian cinema, being directed to much smaller audiences. It's back to this collective choice mechanism. What really makes for good results is a quality audience. And that's the truly scarce variable here. And Hollywood deliberately aims at a not so quality audience. So it, it becomes crud. That's my subjective judgment, but I think it's true. Ooh, um, so here's some an, actually an interesting question. Um, what do you think about the possibility that uh, AI and you know good recent developments with the, the the GPTs and so forth is going to massively decrease the cost of making a movie to the point that a less than institutional actor and even an individual will be able to do it? I think that's already true, even without all of those developments. But what's special about movies is people want to see the same movie as what other people are seeing. That means you end up with a pretty high degree of centralization no matter what. Just like this is sports true. leagues. Mm -hmm. Well, Michael Jordan, LeBron, they're the best players, yes. But you want to talk to other people about them. So I'm not sure how much it will matter. Mm -hmm. We'll get this blossoming. It'll mean that the big players will pull from a bigger tent of talent. That has to be a good thing, right? But still, there'll be the centralization at the top. Right, there will be centralization, but like the mechanisms that we have for um, pushing things into a uh, kind of massive heights of popularity to the point where they get that uh, kind of position as the thing that you have to watch them because everyone else watches them. Historically, it's been very uh, kind of institutionally driven and um, you know, Hollywood makes the movies and they market their movies to hell, but this seems like a process that you know, like social media potentially could uh, end up uh, getting into disrupting at some point soon. As you well know, YouTube stars, Instagram stars are typically bigger than movie stars. There may be mm. a few older movie stars, everyone knows them because they became famous in this earlier world. 
But movie stars today, they're not that important. Uh, again, YouTube and Instagram, much more powerful producers of celebrity already. And that's typically not without complex AI or GPT-3. Mm -hmm. um, we want to just ask a couple more questions before we wrap today. And uh, we are a little bit over, so I want to thank you for, for kind of going over it with us. Uh, the question is kind of uh, how do you kind of think uh, crypto will shape uh, the regulatory framework around how finance is structured right now. Uh, do you think it'll be uh, in a positive way? Do you think it'll be because uh, we'll force it to sort of meant to allow some of these applications to work? Uh, is that even a valid question to you? Like, how do you react to the regulatory aspect of cryptocurrencies? Obviously, it depends on the country. The United States, the SEC has been very light on crypto. I would not at all assume that will last. And if Biden is elected, which as we speak, seems more likely. Uh, it's almost certainly not going to last. And then there's this longer term issue as banks move into tech and fintech moves into services closer to banking, how will the regulators react when banking and commerce start to mix in the United States? That will have major implications for crypto. I wouldn't say I have a particular prediction, but I think if you wanna think through the future of crypto, just the regulatory side, don't assume, you know, the light hand is going to last. I would bet against that, you know, at least five to one and we'll see what comes. I don't know. Um, so we'll just do two more questions and we'll be for, for both of you. Uh, so the second last question I have is if uh, all we end up with is a really efficient replacement for the existing financial infrastructure, and that's kind of the primary and the most exciting use case for blockchains, uh, is that a win? Uh, in any count from, from each of you. Um, and, and kind of, if, if all we kind of, as you kind of pointed out, if clearing time becomes three seconds instead of three days, um, is that still a net positive for us or not? For me, I, I would say that doesn't excite me. But again, there are these options on things like prediction markets, uh, economies, either in virtual reality or in some other future thing that wants to behave in a seamless way that fiat currencies and financial regulation won't allow. I see a reasonably high chance all that can be significant. I'm not ready to predict it. The exciting side lies in these future dimensions that current institutions have just not evolved to handle and they will be slow and sluggish and trying to do so. And crypto is gonna whip their ass if that what comes to pass. So that's the exciting scenario, we'll see. We will see indeed. <laughs> Great. I'm excited. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. So um, the last question I want to ask, and uh, we want to wrap this up based on, on this question is, it's been two years since your last conversation, uh, at least on air. And uh, we want to see if uh, we can end today's chat with making a prediction on what you think the future of Ethereum will be two years from now. Um, I'll we'll kind of take predictions from both sides and uh, we'll call it. What is it two years from now? I didn't uh, hear you. A I'm prediction sorry. on the future of Ethereum two years from now. Uh, what do you think Ethereum specifically will be uh, down the road, whether that's a political answer or a technological answer or, or a user adoption answer? Um, what do you kind of predict for the development of ecosystem, the Ethereum ecosystem? Vitalik deserves the last word, so let me go first. <clears throat> it will be more of an august mainstream institution known to more people Vitalik will be more of an elder statesman. Uh, and it will all feel like more grave and serious, but it will be doing uh, more things. That's my prediction. Hmm. I think uh, I mean, we are going to see just, first of all, a continued steady growth. And I'm very hopeful that all of the things that we're doing with technology, including you know, sharding, roll-ups, proof of stake, zero knowledge proofs, and all of these things will be you know, continue progressing extremely quickly, the same way that um, you know, ZK Snarks have been progressing extremely quickly in the last year. Um, and this will be a kind of necessary bedrock to enable um, a lot more applications to, um, to happen. And I think we will continue to see, as we have seen historically, um, people attempt to try to break out and make crypto things that uh, just kind of go viral independently um, and uh, try to reach uh, kind of larger numbers of people. Um, so two years ago, we've seen uh, CryptoKitties as 
them uh, as one example. I mean, I think there are going to be more examples, and and I think uh, the, these examples are each going to be kind of more interesting and uh, meaningful than the um, than the previous. And, and once the tech is uh, actually there to handle it, that when the thing uh, gets uh, uh, just when the thing gets big, the uh, uh, transaction fees don't just immediately um, force it to come screeching to a stop. Like once that stops being a factor, I think uh, the results uh, may well be amazing. Amazing. Uh, Tyler Vitalik, thank you so much uh, for being with us uh, today and uh, sharing your thoughts. I'm sure there'll be a lot more follow-ups on Twitter and, and other platforms, and uh, we'll be sure to relay some of those future questions to you. Thank you. Thank you, Kartik. Thank you, Vitalik. A real pleasure and honor. Yes. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thanks. And uh, with that, I am uh, proud to sort of say that we are at the end of our our ETH Online Summit in the month of October. Uh, we kind of did some of this summary at the beginning of uh, this morning for the, the summits, but this has been an incredible month for us uh, for ETH Global and ETH Online. We had 710 developers uh, spend the last three weeks working on amazing projects. And now uh, we saw uh, 12 of our, our favorites uh, as our finalists present uh, with their live demos. And together we contributed 175 projects just in the last three weeks, uh, scaling, uh, spanning anywhere from DeFi to scalability in Ethereum uh, to experiments with governance. And, uh, and just to summarize how this year has been for us, uh, we've been able to onboard and host uh, 1713 developers uh, over the course of this year uh, by running online and in-person events. And together they've contributed to over 470 projects into the Ethereum ecosystem. Um, as I kind of said this uh, earlier today, uh, some of these projects have gone to become uh, well-funded companies uh, from just this year. Uh, some of them have been uh, just fun experiments. And the thing that's consistent with all of them is that 100% of these projects have been mm. made because the people wanted to build it for themselves and they really cared about sort of bringing that on and trying that out and just working on it directly and sharing it with all of us. So uh, with that said, uh, I would like to thank all of you for spending the last four weeks with us uh, and everybody who was here on the chat and, and our speakers today. And uh, last but not least, uh, even though we're gonna announce some of our future events soon, uh, we are going to hint about and announce that we will be doing ETH Bogota, our, our next hackathon that will be in person uh, on August 6th to 8th in Bogota, Colombia in uh, tandem with DEF CON. So I uh, kind of do keep an eye out, uh, out on this announcement. And I want to thank all of you here for being with us. So thanks again. And hope you have a great uh, afternoon and evening and uh, night. And uh, goodbye.